the creature in the transition state, neither caterpillar nor butterfly, you think, you know, you think of the butterfly as something that is almost weightless, you know, that, that is just uh -huh. splitting around very light. Um, and <clears throat> the um, caterpillar is obviously the heavy thing, but your representation here or the ideas there um, are very heavy that you, you have, you know, the, the butterfly is pinned to something. <laughs> they, uh -huh. they're, they're not free. Um, and the freest thing on the page really is, um, in some ways, is this sort of free-form, loopy drawing of the caterpillar, which could be attached to the page. It could be something that's lifting off right now, but it doesn't seem to be pinned down even though he's, it's drawn to it. And then you have these heavy opposing forces of the hand, which could or should free something, right? But instead, right. it seems to be fixing things into place and the opposing force of the um obviously of of the harpoon which is a, which is again an extension of the hand right but it's not meant to to grasp in a loving way but to grasp in a killing way um and of course then we just we we won't talk about it at this moment or maybe we will but we have the q and the infinity symbol as wings i just oh, I, my mind is so blown by the cues and infinities that I, we just, that's a separate conversation. Um, but I, I love that image. And um, can you, what are some of the choices that you made there that, uh, that if you want to talk about that one, I love that image. Um, you sort of touched on this a bit, that, that idea of the butterflies, which as you said, are something that should be, I think there's a play called Butterflies are Free. But yeah. you're right, there's this sense of, of um, you know, these should be free, these should be... When we think of butterflies in our mind, I think we always think of this, this sense of, of movement, of motion. You know, how often are we fortunate enough to see one even at rest? And so this is going to sound a bit strange, but, you know, there is so much in the novel, uh, you know, the comparison of whales to books mm -hmm. themselves, uh, you know, the idea of the, the, the novel within a novel, the novel as a, as a concept. And, and so for me, this was sort of a strange way of approaching that idea. See, books, they, they really fascinate me because as a physical object, it's just this collection of, of paper and ink. Mm -hmm. You know, the entire story is, is right there within those covers. Um, I'm not sure if I can explain this really well, and it's actually a very simple idea, so I think maybe you'll get this right away from what I'm saying. What fascinates me about books is, you know, to me, they, they, again, this goes back to childhood, they always seem magic. You know, the end of, of whatever you're reading, the conclusion, it's, it's always right there and it always has been. It's completely mm -hmm. fixed in time. You know, it was written whenever it was written. Moby Dick was written in 1851. So this has been exactly the same. Those words have remained fixed on that page for decades, mm -hmm. well, almost two centuries now. <laughs> and... Yet every time I read it, every time anyone reads it, you know, it, it comes alive. It becomes this linear process. It becomes this journey from beginning to end. And even though I know what's going to happen, you know, it, my, my logical and rational mind as a reader knows that the novel is essentially that butterfly pinned to the page. It's not, not going anywhere. There's no motion. It will never change. The words, the narrative. The Melville wrote will never, ever, ever change. You know, they were done when he set them down on paper all those years ago, and they haven't changed since. But my experiences reading it are not only constantly changing, but they, they are constantly alive. You know, each time I read it, it, it becomes something entirely new. It, it moves, and it flows, and it ebbs, and it flies, and it soars, and it plunges every single time, even though it's not, even though it's completely in a sense, dead. It becomes alive. The, the reader makes the story come alive. The reader makes this, this dead thing on a page come to life. So in a sense, for me, looking at those butterflies and thinking about this image, that's, uh, that was the initial connection that I made uh, and why I selected this page mm -hmm. for that particular image. The, the other elements, the ones that you discussed, you were actually very spot on in, in your perception. And there was intended to be a great deal of ambiguity there. Mm -hmm. I, with so many of these pieces, didn't have a specific concrete idea that I felt I absolutely needed to represent in a particular way. And I think that as an artist, any time that you create something and then you, you share it with 
lot of viewers, regardless of how wide that distribution is. Uh, you know, you take a chance, and and their other viewers are going to see what they want to see in it. And at times, that may be completely at odds with what your intention was. But you have you have to accept that risk if that's something that um, if sharing it is something that's very important to you. You know, you, you can't get upset if someone sees something completely different in your piece because viewers bring their own prejudices, their own experiences, their own preferences, and their own ideas to your work. So with so many of these, I knew of that risk, and I, I, I didn't, <clears throat> I suppose kind of like maybe what Melville did. I didn't want to present something really incredibly specific and concrete because I wanted there to be that opportunity for continued meditation on these pieces by viewers. And, and I had hoped that people that looked at them would spend time with each of them and would discover the layers and the subtleties and, and the ambiguities of them all. And I hope that just as I have done with Moby Dick, where I brought so much of my own experience to bear on both the book and this project, that they would do the same with mine. Uh, and it would become this sort of continually echoing and continually radiating outward series of, of ideas and impressions that would just grow and grow and grow. And I think that's very appropriate with Moby Dick itself because... You know, I, I think, my opinion of the book is obviously incredibly high, and I think that it's this magnificent text. It's very much a living text that I think continues, and I, I think you do too based on what you're doing. It okay. continues to be an incredibly important book that still speaks to us now. You know, there are so many stories and novels and, and things from from many, many years ago that are are. are well worth reading, it's very important to us, but in a sense I think they are fixed in time and Moby Dick is not. You know, Moby Dick is very much not fixed in time, but continues to grow and change. Again, it's like magic. So yeah. I hope I'm making some sort of sense here, but the, yes. the, the idea, all of those symbols there, you know, the harpoon, as you said, is it, is it thrusting downward? Is that a killing blow? Is it receding upward? That hand, what is the intention of the hand? Is that a hand of care? Is that a, a hand of love? Or is that hand clasping? Is that a hand of cruelty and capture? The uh, the infinity symbol, of course, takes its basis from, uh, you know, Quohog, his right. mark, but it goes so much more beyond that, not just in terms of what the idea of infinity means, but the way that my caterpillar is laid over the top of those butterflies and as you mentioned the, the deliberate wing symbolism mm -hmm. it, it with so many of these pieces I, I wanted them to function on multiple levels you know you have my marks that were made over the top of these pages and if you choose you can look simply at my marks mm -hmm. but if you begin to look deeper at the way that my marks on those pages relate to what well, my marks on those pages relate to what's beneath and you see the conversation they're having you, you will come up with all sorts of other relationships that, that are not immediately apparent. And that's, I think, what mirrors the way one should read Moby Dick. You can read it for the story itself, the narrative, the narrative of Ahab's obsessive chase of the whale. But if you choose to really read deeper and you begin to see what's moving beneath the text and the way that certain chapters and ideas are having conversations with one another across the book, across the history of the United States, across the, the, the history of literature and storytelling, you see so much more. And in a sense, it becomes almost maddening and terrifying because you, you, you get this idea that you're looking down this long chain of infinity that you'll, you'll never really be able to encompass at all. But, you know, I think the thrill is, is worth saying.